Well, hello, my name is Pastor Aaron. We're so happy you could join us today at Living Stones. Got a lot of great things going, but first of all, we want to know, we want you to know that we want to connect with you, and there's a lot of ways you can connect with us, but one of the best ways to connect with us is through our social media. So if you could do that by subscribing uh, to one of the platforms below, that would be so great. But man, we're really happy you're watching this video today. Um, to celebrate us coming into 2020, we are going through a series called It's Time to Grow Up. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cute and funny things that my uh, one and a half year old Liam or my three year old Uriah do, but if I were to do them, my wife would not think it's very amusing. The same can be said for our spiritual maturity. Um, so what are some of the behaviors and characteristics that demonstrate what it means to be a mature follower of Jesus? Come find out in our sermon today. Hallelujah. While you're doing that, I'm so excited about this morning and about what God has in store for us. This is a transformational morning in the fullest sense of the word. I've been talking to you about spiritual growth. And if you're new here at this church, um, we are not the kind of church that just seeks to see how many people we can fit under one roof and never expect anything from them or challenge them. How many of you know that's a poor excuse for a real church? You should be getting challenged all the time if you read your Bible. If you know God, how I many you know you're always getting challenged because the love of God provokes me to love more. The faith of God provokes me to have more faith. And you, you all understand what I'm talking about. So we're always getting, un in fact, we should call our church Living Stones, the uncomfortable church. <laughs> it wouldn't look good on a t-shirt, but, uh, but it's true. If you're uncomfortable, it means you're being pushed or challenged or stretched. And these are good things. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to stand before the Lord and give an account for our lives. Anybody want to be ready for that appointment? I want to be ready. And anybody want to be a part of the process of seeing a bunch of other people be ready? And anybody want some cool stories along the way? Uh, so how many know spiritual growth is like serious business? I'm saying serious with a smile on my face, but serious nonetheless. Because God invested a huge price in you. The gift of his son. And how many of you know there's an expectation that comes off of an encounter with Jesus that changes us? That's awesome. Spiritual growth is awesome. It just means we're more like Jesus. How many of you know that's a good thing? So turn to your neighbor and just smile at him. Say, lighten up this morning. Spiritual growth is a good thing. Tell him that, all right? Just smile at him real big. Yeah, I'm looking at all of you. I'm seeing how many are listening to me this morning. We're going to have fun whether you like it or not. All right, open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. I want you, if you have your hard copy, get it out. If you have your on your phone, well, do it on your phone. But I want you to personally find Philippians 3. You might say, well, Pastor, I don't have a Bible. Well, you come see Ed. <laughs> and we will help you get a Bible. Everybody should be... This is the second amendment of the kingdom of God. Everybody armed in this church, all right? Everybody armed and dangerous. So get your Bible. This is where we were at. No, dear brothers and sisters, Paul said, I've not achieved it. It meaning spiritual maturity and perfection. But here's what he said, and we hit it last week. I focus. Everybody say focus. I focus on this one thing. I'm forgetting the past. I'm looking forward to what lies ahead. I'm going to press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Last Sunday, I talked about the force of focus. Focus is a force. When you, when you focus things in nature, whether it's water, let's just say, you focus it, you can cut through steel. I talked to a guy one time that worked in the steel mills, and, uh, and he used to go into some big furnace thing with, with a, uh, uh, a high-pressure hose. He said if that hose were directed and, and was magnified to its full strength, literally if you went like that, you would cut a human being in half. That's how powerful focused water is or how powerful focused light is. How about this? How much more powerful would our walk with God be if we started focusing in on what mattered the most? It would be powerful. In fact, it would be life-changing. The problem is, for most of us, we have problems focusing. I talked last week about being marginless, busy, distracted, living in the fog, uh, and the whole curse of hurry in our culture. Hurry, 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 hurry. Uh, and what a problem that is. 
The problem when we're so full of hurry and we're distracted and we're busy, busy, busy is we become irritable. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because every little thing that doesn't fit causes us to get frustrated. We become hypersensitive. Things that shouldn't set us off, set us off. I always give the example of the guy at the four-way stop, and you know he thinks you're going to go first, you think he's going to go first, you wait, you wait, you wait, and the third person goes first, and that person gets the finger waved at him, and somebody almost comes out and commits suicide. You know, on the, It's like, excuse me, I think that guy is struggling with a marginless life because a four-way stop should not bring that out of you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, please don't raise your hands or look at your neighbor or your spouse. How about restlessness? You can't settle down. Compulsive overworking. Can I just tell you, if you're a workaholic, you're hiding and you're missing out on God's ultimate purpose for your life. There's nothing noble about being a workaholic. Emotional numbness. How about escapist behaviors where we do all kinds of crazy things to try to numb the pain or to bring us pleasure? Uh, all kinds of addictive things. We get disconnected from our identity and our calling. We're not able to attend to the needs of people around us. And here's the thing that's sad. If your spiritual walk is slipping because you don't have time to worship on Sunday morning, or you don't have time to spend in the Word of God, or you don't ever talk to God, or you don't ever worship God, or you don't ever meet with God's people because you're too busy, can I just tell you, that is a dangerous place to be, and you'll never grow. You'll never grow. It's like, it's like putting a, a shrub, uh, you know, plucking it out of the ground, setting it on your driveway and hope that it produces all kinds of fruit. It's not going to happen. You have got to get planted and you've got to get focused. And we, we shared last week, spiritual maturity requires a target. And that target that we're after is knowing Jesus. This is what I do. And my life's pretty simple. I hope this works for you. Whenever I'm trying to make a decision, I just ask myself this question. I'm going to add 100 years to my current age right now. And how important is what I'm thinking about? How important is that choice? What, how valuable is that decision or that thing in light of eternity? I mean, this is a game changer. Because there's lots of good things. Can I just tell you another thing? I've been in, I don't know how many nations of the world over my life. Many, many nations. Dozens and dozens of nations. Can I just tell you one thing about the Church of Jesus Christ globally? In countries that have less freedom and have less money, they're happier than we are. It's the truth. Full of the joy of the Lord. How many of you know our blessings and our freedom can become curses if we misuse them? Every, let me just tell you this. If you all that are football fans, cheer your guts out today, all right? Cheer your guts out. You guys that love pizza, mm, just go, mm, mm, this is the best. Mm, lick your lips, mm, wipe. Just enjoy the pizza. There are so many pleasures in life that God gave us. Enjoy them all to the max, but never enjoy them more than the focus, which is knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus. Do I do this? Well, does it help me know Jesus? Does it help me grow in my walk with Jesus? Does it get me ready to meet Jesus? Does it help me understand my calling and fulfill my calling? This is Jesus is the laser point. That's why we're here. And I said focus last week involves choices. Look what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. A little bit earlier in, in the chapter. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, rubbish, trash, filth, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Can I just share this? Look at this phrase. It says, everything else is, that I thought was valuable is now considered worthless because of what Christ has done. How many of you know when you give your life to Christ, it is a defining, earth-shaking, life-changing moment that, that turns your life upside down? One person knows that. Accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior is not a casual thing. It's life transforming. Jesus takes a selfish, broken person and turns me inside out and causes me to care about things I never cared about before. 
trying to find somebody who can relate to what I'm talking about. All right. All right. I need a little help this morning. Don't if you... There are things that used to make me excited that because of Christ don't have that effect any longer. There are things that used to be so attractive when I was a teenager that I thought were so important when I was a teenager that now I realize that was stupid. I mean, a part of good parenting is helping your teenager to know that what they think is cool now is going to be stupid in 20 years or less, 20 minutes. They don't, it doesn't matter anymore. Things that used to be such a big deal, it doesn't matter anymore. Why doesn't it matter anymore? It's not that they're, it, they're not even important. You know, like sports, sports in my life when I was a young man, that was such a big deal, man, playing under the lights, Friday night, Lake Central, come on. Uh, and then I realized in time, not that big of a deal. In fact, in eternity, zero. Only the thing that's mattering from my involvement with sports was the Christ likeness that it developed and as a platform to love people, share Jesus with people. That's all that matters. You fill in the blank to the thing that you think is important. Your money, your job, your career, your whatever. Your family. Yeah, your family is important. But listen, your family is only important if they know Jesus. And if they don't know Jesus, that should deeply concern you. Like, what are you doing to help that happen? To pray, to go after them. Because even family is such a good thing. My family, my family, people worship their family. And they make an idol out of their family. Your family is not supposed to be worshipped. Jesus is supposed to be worshipped. And part of spiritual maturity is realizing that you have to be able to separate what's valuable from what's worthless. What's valuable from what's worthless. Now, I was just leaving my son Johnny's basketball game uh, last night. And, you know, I'm getting to know some of the parents and stuff like that. And this one dear lady, we're walking out the door, and she said, are you staying for the varsity game? I said, no, we can't stay for the varsity game. i gotta, I got to get going. And um, she said, what time does your day start on Sunday? And I told her. And she said, oh, I feel so sorry for you. You're one of the only people in the world that has to get up on Sunday and can't sleep in. I just looked at her like, Excuse me, I was letting the air out of my head. What? Can I just tell you something? Getting up early on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, and spending time with Jesus is fun. This is not part of my job description. This is not my career. Jesus Christ encountered me when I was 16. Actually, when I was 7, but he rocked me when I was 16. My life's never been the same. I don't get up early, and it's cold outside, and it's dark because someone has a gun to my head. I get up early because I love Jesus, and I like to be with him. I like to talk to him. I like to pray. I like to pray for you. I like to pray for the church. I like to cry out, help me, God. I want to finish well. I want to love well. I love Jesus because I'm a Christian. And I've had a supernatural encounter that changed my life forever. This is not a duty. I kept thinking, how many people have experienced dead religion? They've lost the passion of what it is to know the Son of God. They've lost their target. Everything's become a burden. This should never be a burden. It should be the highlight of your week. Being with the Lord and being with his people. It should be the highlight of your week. It should be, I can't wait. Can't wait. You might think I'm nuts and I don't do this every morning, but this morning I did. I walked out into the single degree digits. So, you know, I just have this habit. When, when I hit my knee on something, I go, oh, that felt great. That felt great. Mm. I'm prophesying. I'm prophesying. To, I just do it all the time. Marion laughed at me the other day. I whacked my shoulder on something. I said, ha, ah, that felt great. All right. I'm invincible. All right. In Christ. I walked out this morning, that air hit me, and I said, ha, ha, there wasn't a person on the street. There's barely a light bulb awake. You know what I said? Thank you, Lord. It's a great day to be alive. I'm glad I'm yours. You're such a great father. 
You're such a great father. Thank God my neighbors weren't awake. God only knows what they would be thinking. But this is not a joke. This is not religious instruction. Are you kidding me? This is a relationship with the Son of God. I like it. I like it. I like him. Here's the problem. Paul said, you know what? If we're going to focus on Jesus, we've got to forget the past. Now, let me lay some groundwork here today. Forgetting the past. How in the world do we get free? Let me ask you this. Does anybody out here besides me have any regrets? Like, how about the if only game? Anybody play the if only game? How about this? If only I could do it over again. Like, just rewind the tape. Maybe you made some poor choices, bad experiences. I get it. How about this? I wish I would have listened sooner. Or I would add, I wish I would have listened, period. You know, I used to like it. We never disciplined our kids in front of their siblings. We always did it in private. But I always wanted them to be close by. Like on the other side of the door. Because there's something redemptive about hearing your older sibling getting a paddle on their behind. My son Ronnie made the escape one, uh, mistake one time. He's, now he's, he's a pastor. He turned out good, so don't look at me that way. <laughs> but he looked at me one time when he was a little guy, and he turned around with snaggle teeth. He said, Daddy, <laughs> that didn't even hurt. <laughs> I said, thank you, son, for helping your dad out. Because you know what? There's supposed to be a sting on your butt. Because the sting on your butt's to remind you not to talk that way, act that way, do what you just did ever again. It's for your good. Let me help you remember better. <laughs> now, here's, here's the redemptive aspect. Smart siblings go, dude, we ain't going to act that way in front of dad. Because stupid people don't learn from the mistakes of others. But smart people listen, and they apply. Don't you wish you could have some do-overs, like you would have listened to whatever your dad said, your mom said, your pastor said, whoever said, it might have saved you some pain. How about the, if I could only erase my past? How about this one, if I could only forgive myself? Some of you this morning, you're like, man, I, you know, can't believe I did that. What a stupid thing. I'm still paying the consequences for my, for my stupid mistake. Hey, I got, I got news for you. Stop putting the focus on your failure and start putting the focus on what Jesus did on the cross for you. Stop elevating the greatness of your failures and start elevating the goodness of God's son. That's, that's, that's the shift that needs to happen this morning. Paul said, hey, no one's perfect. We've not arrived. We all have regrets. We've all made bad choices. How about this one? We've all said foolish things. Can I get an amen? I got both hands up. We've all wasted time. We've all hurt ourselves, and we've all hurt others. We're all on common ground. So here's my question. So how do you release your regrets? How do you get rid of them? How do you, how do you stop? Paul said this. We've got to stop focusing on the past. We need, In fact, we need to forget the past, and we need to start looking to the future. That's a choice that we all have to make. How do you do that? Let me tell you three ways as a pastor you don't do it. You don't bury your past. We all have a past. You'll never be able to get launched into the future God has for you if you bury the past. Well, how do you bury the past? Let me give you some ways. First of all, we minimize it. We say, well, it really wasn't such a big deal. How many of you know all sin is a big deal? Sin, even the minutest sin, costs God the sacrifice of his son. Never minimize your past. It's a big deal, all right? It is a big deal. Never rationalize it. People say, well, you know, everyone does it. Have you parents ever had that one from any of your kids? Everybody is doing it. And then you launch into this great speech. I don't care if everybody's doing it. If everybody, remember this one from mom and dad? If everybody jumped off a bridge, would you jump off? Yeah, I had kids that were like, yeah, I want to go jump off that bridge. That'd be awesome. Whoa. I had kids like that. I'm like, no, you're not going to jump off the bridge. If everybody, we're not doing what everybody's doing. It doesn't matter. You don't, you don't rationalize your sin. How about this? You don't compromise. You don't lower your standards and say, oh, well, hey, you know, whatever. No, don't lower your standards. Don't rationalize. Don't minimize. But here's the deal. If you still have those regrets and you're trying to bury them, they're going to come back and haunt you over and over and over again. I just prayed with a man this morning, haunted by choices he made in his high school years. That still the devil comes back and reminds him. 
So how does he do it? He's got to deal with that so he can move forward. We'll talk about that in just a minute. How about this one? This is the second thing that will not be helpful. Stop blaming others for your painful past. Other people might be responsible for the pain, but how many of you know Jesus is responsible for your future? And Jesus is a future redeemer and a past healer. We sang about it this morning. That's why I provoked you guys. I asked you straight to your face. Do you really believe that God is big enough to redeem every single part of your broken past and turn it into something that you worship him for and rejoice? Do you really believe that? Because that's what he's doing. But it never happens if you blame other people. You know, I'm just I'm, this is some pastoral exhortation I'm just throwing out here. If you're one of those people that every week you're among God's people, you bring out your record. You know that broken record that you play every week where you tell everybody, woe is me. Don't look at your neighbor. This is not the time to look at your neighbor. If you keep playing that woe is me record, I'm already prophesying what's probably happening in your life. You don't have a lot of friends. Pastor, you're so prophetic. No, I'm not. Let me just tell you why you don't have friends. Everybody's tired of that song and dance. Stop the record. Quit blaming everybody. Well, you know, I could be doing this, but this happened. Who cares? It happened 20 years ago. Knock it off. Why don't you stop looking back and blaming everybody and start looking forward and growing? I love you guys so much. You know, sometimes people, and these people that come through and minister, they're so awesome. These guys that travel all the time. Let me tell you why they're awesome. They don't know any of us that well. But you know, when you're in the local church for a long time and you really get to know people, sometimes what people, the best, most loving thing you can tell somebody is, you know what? Quit blaming and start moving forward. It's time to grow up. Let, let, let's put away that song and dance in 2020. Let's move ahead. People that love you will tell you that. People that tolerate you will just smile and then run and try to find some place to hide. You all know I'm telling the truth. If you want to expand your social network this year, start being fo future focused and not stuck in your past. And quit blaming other people for where you're at. It's not their fault. How are you? Who put this here? No, I'm sorry. Moving on. Moving on. All right. Quit beating yourself up. Oh my gosh. Oh, I can't believe I did that. Oh, my God, I'm such a loser. Stop it. Can I tell you who else nobody wants to hang around with? People that take pleasure in beating themselves up. You have a bright future, like everybody that knows Jesus. Let's focus on the future. Let's quit beating ourselves. Why would you beat yourself up if God allowed his son to be beat up for you? That was a great question right there. Why do you keep punching yourself when that's the whole purpose of the cross? So do you see how disobedient we are when we keep burying, blaming, beating ourselves up? Come on, we got to quit that. So pastor, how do I get free? Well, let me talk, tell you how you get free. Paul gave us a secret. I, I call it faith-filled forgetfulness. Now, if I asked you, how many of you think forgetfulness is a virtue? Most of you go, no, it's not a virtue. I hate it when I forget things, you know, right? It's not a virtue. Well, forgetting to get the milk at the grocery store might not be a virtue, but let me tell you, forgetting your past is an incredible virtue. And let me tell you how this works. I want to give you some points here. First of all, forgetting is really a matter of focus. This word forgetting doesn't mean you don't have any knowledge of something. Can I just pop everybody's bubble? When, when we talk about getting healed from the past, God doesn't scrub your memories and all of a sudden you don't remember the, the abuse or the trauma that you went through or the loss of a loved one. That's not what forgetting means. Forgetting means we make a conscious choice not to place our focus on what's behind us, but to place our focus on the future. This word means neglecting the past, refusing to focus on, overlooking the past. The idea is this. I'm not going to live my life looking backwards. I'm going to make a choice. Now, hear me. Who makes choices? Me. Who has the power to make a choice today? 
I, I'm, I'm getting really real here. This will change somebody's life. I hope it changes a lot of people's lives. I'm challenging you in the power of your volition, made in the image and likeness of God, to set your will in agreement with God's word and to make a choice. This is the choice today. I am not going to spend my life looking in the rearview mirror. I am going to believe that the future God has for me is better than the past that the enemy tried to destroy. And you know what? Everyone in this room can make that choice. You can leave here miserable, blaming, bearing, beating yourself up. Or you could say, I'm going to believe what God says. And I'm going to make a conscious decision to start moving forward with great excitement and expectation and hope. Because I'm going to believe that the God of my future is greater than the enemy in my past. It's a matter of focus. Look, look, what, look what the prophet Isaiah said. This is Isaiah 43. He said, but forget all that. Now, it's interesting. When you look at Isaiah 43 in context, what's the all that he's talking about? Well, let me just summarize. The all that is everything God did in Egypt to humiliate the Egyptian theocracy and to release his people from slavery after 400 years. God says, forget all that stuff. I mean, that's like a pretty big deal. It's like the centerpiece of the whole Old Testament, all right? God says, forget all that stuff. Listen, though, why? It is nothing compared to what I am going to do, for I'm about to do something new. Can everybody say new? I've already begun. Do you not see it? I'm going to be making pathways through areas that were the wilderness in your life. I'm going to create rivers in places that were dry wastelands. This is amazing. Some people are so busy looking at the past, their hurts, their failures, all their insecurities, and God's going, hello, I'm doing something new now. Can you not see it? Let me tell you why you can't see it. You'll never see what God's doing if you're stuck in your past. There are people that, there are people that get stuck in their ministry past. I, I want to encourage everybody that's been on planet five decades or more. I realize it takes a little more extra effort to get out of bed in the morning and get your awesomeness started. But can I just tell you something? Quit looking back and thinking your best days are behind you. Your best days are ahead of you to the very end. Some of you in this room, the wine that you have, the anointing that you have, the wisdom that you have, the character development that God has worked in you over five, six, seven, eight decades is pure gold. Stop looking back and thinking that somehow you're past your prime. Your prime in God is always now and in the future, period. There are people who say, well, you know, I remember the good old days at Livingstone. Stop it. As long as you're looking at the good old days, you're going to miss the glory days of what God's trying to do now. He says, I'm doing something new. Now, 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 now. But you know, some people go, well, you know, I just don't know what pastor was talking about. Heard the same message, heard the same exhortation, but check this out, responded differently. And blame somebody else. Let me just prophesy to you, stuck, 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 stuck. You're going to be stuck, 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 stuck. Welcome to 2020. Let me help you out too. It's going to be miserable. It's going to be miserable. It's going to be terrible. And let me give you the third point. And it'll be somebody else's fault. <laughs> Welcome to 2020. Let's go out and get drunk and stoned because we're, God help us, we can't face reality. I can't go off on that track. Number two, forgetting means I'm no longer going to be a slave to my past. The Bible says this, the old is gone and the new life has begun. Can I tell you why we do celebrate recovery and why we preach the gospel and why we have classes on inner healing, why we do the encounter weekends? Listen to me. Nobody is beyond the power of Jesus to change them. So, you know, you go, oh, you know, that guy, my ex-spouse, that guy's a real, you know. And uh, I don't ever see any chance of that guy changing. You need to start looking and get hope back in your heart and start looking at the power of the gospel to change people and believing the best about people. Well, you know, that person's been addicted to drugs for 20 years. Yeah, that's true. That's still part of their reality, but that's not a part of their future. And I'm going to fight for them and love them and believe the best for them because Jesus changes people. 
Well, you know what? I don't like going to Living Stones because sometimes people at Living Stones have a checkered past. <laughs> so do you! <laughs> no, Living Stones will be a place where broken people love it here because we're real and we're free and we're moving forward. That's what Living Stones is all about because we believe people can change. How about you? Do you believe that? Do you believe you can change? I just want to, for the record, I believe you can change, and I want you to believe I'm going to keep changing for the better because none of us have arrived. Moving on here. How I many you know we don't want to be putting our hands to the plow and then looking back? This is another problem people have. Well, you know, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you at the altar, but ever since I did that, man, my life has really sucked. I'm wondering if I need to go back to my old life. This is the word of, of, for the Lord for you from Jesus. Anybody who puts their hand in the plow and looks back isn't fit to be mine. That's in the Bible. That was the Jesus with the little kids on his lap. He said that, not me. How about Lot's wife? As she's being delivered from a very, very wicked place, she's looking back. Why is she looking back? Because her heart's still attracted to the world. God said, look, forget the past. How much do we have to wallow in our own vomit before we realize there's nothing there? Why do we glorify a wicked, empty past when God's inviting us an awesome future? Why do we do that? People do it all the time, like a dog returning to its vomit. Forget the past. Believe that God has a better future for you. Third point, very quickly, forgetting actually demands that we learn how to remember. Look what Paul says in the, as he starts Philippians chapter 1. I thank my God every time I remember you. Now this is so good. In Acts 16, we find out what Paul was trying to remember or what was good about remembering. Anybody remember Acts 16? Let me give you a quick overview. In Acts 16, Paul is in Philippi. That's where he met all these people. What happened in Philippi? Anybody remember Lydia in the Bible? God opened her eyes. She saw the gospel. She got saved. Uh, amazing story of transformation. And then do you remember this story? There's this demonized girl, servant girl, that's following Paul and Silas around. Remember that? And I love it because this is just so real sometimes. It doesn't say the apostle Paul moved with compassion, cast the devil out of this poor demonized slave girl. This is what the Bible says. Paul got ticked off and irritated that she kept following him around, prophesying all this stuff and driving him nuts. That's what the Bible says. So he finally turns around and he casts the devil out of this lady. But they were using her to make a lot of money. And can I just share something else? If, if money is your idol, you're not going to grow much in 2020, spiritually. Your bank account might grow, but you're not going to grow much spiritually. These people love the money they made off this poor demonized girl, then they, then they rejoiced in her freedom. So what happened? They got a mob together. They gathered around Paul. The Bible says Paul and Silas were severely beaten. Not just beaten a little bit. Severely beaten. They were improperly put in jail. Uh, bad, uh, bad police work, all right? It was against the law. Put in jail. They're mocked. They're vilified. And finally, after they're whipped and humiliated, they're thrown out of the prison and they're told to get out of town. Now, here's my question to you. Paul said, I thank God every time I remember you. What was he remembering? i tell you what he was remembering, not the whipping, not being put in prison. He's, he made a conscious choice to remember the amazing things that God did in the people that he met. How many of you know in every situation in life, every situation in life, you can find the goodness of God? The question is this, what are you focusing on? You know, how about relationships? Julia, anybody ever let you down? You got that pensive look, like you're, like you're in deep thought. Anybody, any human being ever let you down? Now, this is interesting. You know the people who hurt us the most when they let us down? The people that we're closest to. People, I mean, if a stranger at, at Jewel Osco lets me down, I'm like, oh, I'm crushed. That, that person didn't put my cart back in where it belonged. I don't know, I, whatever the scenario. I don't, I'm not crushed. But here's the deal. Like, if Julia lets me down, I've got, I know Julia. I have a relationship with Julia. If she lets me down, I feel it more. So here's the point. When people let us down, why don't we focus on the good of the relationship instead of the bad? Every relationship that God's brought into our life has probably been a mixture. And the ones that have hurt us the most have actually hurt us the most because it's been a mixture of great good and great disappointment. So why don't we start focusing on 
the good in people. And can I just challenge you, some of you in this room today, before you leave, and I'm going to cut you loose in just a moment, before you leave and before you take communion, you need to make a conscious choice to forgive somebody. To forgive. To make the choice that you're not going to look in the past and say, I'm going to punish you forever. You don't deserve it. Look what you did to me. My life is ruined. Oh, no, 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 no. Why don't you consciously choose to shift and say, no, no, I'm going to bless you because I believe that God has a better future for you and God certainly has a better future for me. I'm going to focus on what lies ahead. Some of you need to do this this morning. You need to forgive somebody. That's why we receive communion. It's a reminder that we have been forgiven much. In fact, isn't this amazing? You remember the woman with the alabaster jar of ointment that came to Jesus and poured it all over him and, and made everybody really awkward because of the extravagance of her affection. Remember that? She, she was a woman of ill repute. She had a history. She came at Jesus' feet. Her tears were, were falling on his feet, and she was washing his feet with her hair. Made everybody feel uncomfortable except Jesus, because this is what Jesus saw. This woman has been forgiven of a lot, and that's why she loves me so much. Can I remind us all, just a little helper here, if we did just a little history of accounts, we've all been forgiven of a lot. Why is it sometimes that the people who have been forgiven of most feel like they have to be the judges of everybody else? Some of the people who should be most grateful to God are the most critical people in the world. And let me tell you why we're critical, because we've lost sight. We failed to remember the goodness of God. People that have been forgiven of a lot and they know it, they are great lovers of other people. Can this place be a place by the grace of God where we are great lovers of people? Because we remember what God has done for us and we choose to forget what people have done to us for the sake of the gospel. And we're going to focus on the good and what's pleasing and cover sin and love people and believe the best for people and keep encouraging people along the journey because that's what Jesus has done for us. Let me end with this. And I want our worship team to come up here right now just to hold me accountable. <laughs> Forgetting lastly involves, I love this. I love it because they all start with F. Flaunting my former failures. Oh, this is so good. Let me tell you the balance here. Sometimes people feel, feel like I've got to deal with my past. I have to forget it. I have to leave it way, 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 way back in my history. And I never want to, I never want to go there again. You remember the guy in the Bible that was full of demons? In fact, he lived in the cemetery. He used to howl at nighttime. Not a, not a guy that you probably liked hanging out with, you know, full of demons howling and cutting himself bloody all the time. And then he encountered Jesus. Remember that beautiful story? And Jesus after, after one encounter with Jesus, this guy's sitting at Jesus' feet in his right mind, totally at peace. Isn't Jesus awesome? I mean, Jesus is awesome. What an amazing God we serve that could take that kind of person and transform them and put them in their right mind. This is what Jesus said to that man. He said, go home to your friends and tell them what wonderful things God has done for you. And how merciful he has been. This is what Jesus is saying. Go tell everybody who you were and what you did. And then tell them who I am and what I've done for you. You know, can I just share something with you? You know, next, next Sunday, when we do Sanctity of Life Sunday, what I love about Living Stones is there's been men and women who have been personally impacted by abortion in this place. And as God brings them through a process of healing, and they realize that uh, they've been forgiven and God begins to heal their heart. You know what's really cool? They don't hide that in the past. They testify about it publicly. They say, this is who I was. This is what I did. But then this is what Jesus did. And this is who I am now. And you know what? Every time people are honest with their brokenness and their pain, somebody in the audience gets set free because the pain of our past was never meant to bury. The pain of our past was meant to flaunt before the enemy 
that was who I was. That is what I did. I own it. I don't blame anybody for it. I own it. But this is what God's done in my life. I told you that story about my daughter coming home from the women's encounter. I said, how was it, babe? She said, oh, it was awesome. She said, but I, I never realized how absolutely messed up our leadership ladies were. <laughs> and you know what? I just smile. Because the truth of the matter is, every one of us has been messed up. We've all done things we wish we could go back and do over. But it's beautiful when somebody says, that's who I was. You know, in the Bible, there's a, there's a neat story. You know, when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how I many of you know they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit, but they come through the personalities of the writer. So Mark's going to be different than Matthew. Matthew's going to be different than John. You all get the point. There's two words that are paired together in the Bible that go together. It's called sinners and tax collectors. Anybody ever read that in the Bible? Now, here's the question I always ask. You're a lawyer. You have a trained mind. Sinners, that pretty much covers it all. But in the Bible, they separate tax collectors into a, a special group of exceptionally well sinners, like sinners at a whole other level, like despicable at a whole other level. Which one of the four gospel writers was a tax collector? Matthew was. Matthew the tax collector. I want to show you something amazing. Matthew was hated and despised. There was no IRS tax code to follow. These guys were scoundrels. They made money wherever they could. They ripped off whatever people they could rip off. Matthew was one of those, and then he encounters Jesus. But when Matthew writes his account of the gospel, and he starts listing all the guys Jesus called to follow him, I want you to look at this first. This is from Matthew's account. There's The names of the 12 are these. Simon, who's also called Peter. Uh, Andrew, his brother. James, son of Zebedee. Now we're going to tell where he's from. John, his brother. We've got all the pedigree, pedigree going. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. Why would the brother put that in his own gospel? Matthew included a little statement about just how much of a scoundrel he was to remind himself that that's the one Jesus called. And this is interesting because you'd think he would keep that hidden. We're talking about his past right now. He's been dead for a long time. But I want you to see, Matthew took his past and used it as a bridge to reach people. What's the first evangelistic crusade Matthew did? Look, at, look on the screen. Go to the next one if you would. Later, Levi, or Matthew, held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Who did he invite to the party? Many of his fellow tax collectors and other guests ate with him. Who did he invite? He invited all the scoundrels with him to have a party. And you all know, Jesus, one of the worst things that the Pharisees said about Jesus happened because of his association with Matthew. They said, this Jesus guy, he ain't God. He ain't a prophet. He ain't the Messiah. You know why? He actually eats with sinners and tax collectors. Look what happened next. Later, Levi invited Jesus and the disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many other tax collectors, and look what Mark adds, and other disreputable sinners, as if there's such a thing as reputable sinners. This is disreputable. How many of you know that was a list you did not want to be on, that invitation list, all right? There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. This is so awesome. Let me tell you what Matthew is doing. This is the scoundrel I used to be. That scoundrel met Jesus. Now, let me tell you who I am. And let me go to all my other disreputable friends and let them know that I was once one of you. But let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. I, mean, I want you to see this. Your past is meant to be redeemed. It's meant to be healed so that you can stop focusing on it, be trapped by it, so you can make a choice to start living in your future. But don't leave your past behind you. Bring it along as an object lesson to bring other people to Jesus. There's something really powerful about a person that can stand up and say, you know what? I once did this, or I once did that, or I once was involved with this. That's who I was. I'm not proud of it. That's who I was. But I'm a changed person now. 
And it's because of Jesus. And if you're dealing with the same lifestyle challenges, I want you to know there's hope for you because there was hope for me. That's being real. That's being authentic. That's why how Greg and Deb, one of the most powerful parts of Celebrate Recovery is the testimony. We overcome the enemy of our past by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Don't ever be shy about who you were. Use it to beat the devil's brains out. In fact, can I just tell you this? I know when people aren't free yet of a certain sin because they don't let anybody know. Secrecy in the church family is the worst thing because it means you're not willing to get set free yet. But you know what? When you're free, you can say, you know what? I used to struggle with pornography. I used to be involved in this. I used to be a drug addict. I, I, I killed a man in my youth. Whatever the situation is. You're in pretty good company, biblically speaking. You'll, be, you'll have lots of friends and disreputable sinners and tax collectors who will be able to come to your party and my party when we get free. So here's what we want to do today. I want to have our team come up and take their spots behind the communion area. Part of the reason why we like having people there and not just communion elements is because this is a family church and our desire is to serve you and love you. In fact, Jerry and Terry, come on up. Grab, grab some folks. Go, go right. Andrew and Debbie, come on up. Drew and Shade, come on up over here, will you? Unless you've got to keep an eye on that baby. Somebody can come on and watch that baby. Maybe he's sleeping, huh? All right, well, not that baby in your arms ain't sleeping. That. All right, there we go. Guys, come on over and just serve people. Here's, what, here's what's going to happen. Service is going to be officially over. You guys are free to go. But here's what I want you to do is think about your past and think about what that means to forget for you and what that means to make a choice to look into the future. Also, this is a great time to forgive somebody. And just to, that's what we do every time we take communion. We, for, we forgive and we forget. We say, Lord, forgive me. And Lord, I choose to release that person from the past. When you release them, you set them free to become the person God's called them to be. All right? If you don't know Christ, we're waiting for you right here. We want to pray with you this morning. We got to pray with a precious lady this morning, just, just weeping and crying and giving her heart to God. It was awesome. There might be somebody here today that you've just simply not given your life, your past, your present, or your future to the Lord. That's what you need to do today. Uh, God's waiting for you, all right? So the band's going to lead us. Why don't you stand to your feet? Uh, as you feel ready, come on down and then slip on out. If you've got kids in class, go get them. Uh, but have an amazing, amazing week, all right? We love you. Father, bless this time. Speak to hearts, Lord. Let there be some conscious decisions to focus on Jesus and forget where we've come from and start getting a vision on where we're going. Father, bless this time. Bless these emblems as we receive them. Bless our time of communion, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.